signal to the host immune system. I am Dr. Chad Schwartz of Beckman Coulter, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter. Beckman Coulter is a leader in centrifugation and flow cytometry and has long been an innovator in particle characterization, laboratory automation, and genomics. Beckman Coulter products are used at the forefront of important areas of investigation and discovery. For more information, please visit BeckmanCoulter.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can, con you can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the, the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker. After receiving his MD and PhD in neuroscience from the University of Siena, Stefano completed a residency program in neurology at the same university and received additional training at the MRC Brain Repair Center, Cambridge University in UK. He then completed two subsequent postdoctoral fellowships with Gianvato Martino at the San Rafael Scientific Institute, Milan, Italy, where he progressed to the position of project and the group leader. Stefano is currently a university lecturer in brain repair and honorary consultant in neurology at the University of Cambridge, UK, within the Center for Brain Repair. He is also a European Research Council starting independent researcher and member of the Department of Clinical Neurosciences. I will now turn it over for his presentation. Thanks very much, Chad, uh, for the kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity today to share some of the data that my group has generated in the last few years. And one of the reasons why we got interested in uh, studying uh, uh, this, uh, how stem cells signal to the immune system uh, is um, due to a number of reasons, which uh, I will go into details uh, in a moment. Uh, the, the major reason is that uh, the background of, of, of my lab uh, uh, has been initially funded on neuroimmunology, uh, that we attempted initially to uh, cure uh, preclinical uh, uh, models of multiple sclerosis with stem cells, and that we discovered a number of, uh, of uh, 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 non-canonical interactions between, uh, between transplanted stem cells uh, uh, into uh, um, mice with experimental immunoencephalomyelitis as a model of MS. What we know today um, uh, uh, about uh, uh, the, uh, the preclinical work uh, with uh, non hematopoietic stem cells is that uh, uh, non hematopoietic stem cell transplants uh, work uh, beautifully in uh, uh, animal models of uh, 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 experimental, uh, uh, experimental uh, CNS diseases. And the reason why they work is combination of uh, very limited uh, uh, replacement of endogenous cells but remarkable promotion of tissue healing. And this uh, uh, data come from experiments on uh, EAE as a model of MS, um, uh, on uh, mice with uh, experimental ischemic or hemorrhagic brain stroke, and in mice with spinal cord injuries. We also know that uh, uh, stem cell transplants work uh, for what is called a rescue effect. They actually are able to protect what's left after the damage. And again, here, here you can see in the slide, uh, uh, a number of animal disease models from which uh, the second aspect of tissue protection driven by transplanted stem cells has been uh, observed. Um, however, they also work uh, because uh, 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 transplanted stem cells are able to uh, modulate uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, immune responses of the host which are intrinsically flexible in nature um, and which are uh, very much dependent uh, from, the, um, from the, uh, the disease model and the pathophysiology that we, uh, as investigators, are attempting to cure via stem cell transplantation. And here you can see three, three different uh, 
evidence, so the interaction between the stem cell graft and the autoimmune system, which uh, turned out to be um, uh, associated to modulation of uh, T cell responses in EAE, modulation of uh, innate microglia or microphage cleaving uh, immune responses in uh, cerebral ischemic hemorrhagic stroke, and uh, uh, similarly, modulation of uh, macrophage responses in mice with experimental spinal cord injury. Now, uh, uh, the, the, uh, everything started, uh, uh, the reason why transplanted stem cells might um, uh, interact with, with autoimmune cells starts from uh, the idea that uh, the stem cell graft uh, is um, uh, um, provided of remarkable pathotropism, where for pathotropism we uh, mean the capacity of the graft to sense uh, uh, specifically uh, dysfunctional microenvironment uh, with uh, uh, kind of intercellular communication programs which start already at the time uh, uh, stem cells are grafted uh, into, uh, into the brain parenchyma. And in this slide you can see nice, uh, nice evidence of, um, of uh, uh, pathotropism uh, uh, um, in, in, uh, intended as to be modulated by interaction between uh, uh, um, additional molecule and chemical receptor expressing transplanted cells, stem cells, and uh, activated endothelial cells, uh, or uh, uh, secondly, uh, interaction uh, uh, at the level of the cellular junctions of the epithelia, where uh, chemical receptor expressing stem cells are able to migrate into, into the brain parenchyma. So the pathotropism is important already at the time of an initial interaction between the graft and the outer endothelial site. Uh, once stem cells uh, are able to migrate into the brain parenchyma, uh, this uh, intercellular communication program continues also at the level of the inner endothelial site. And uh, the, the overall result of this very sophisticated interaction is that we uh, witness a limited survival of the graft, usually between 0.5 and 1% of transplanted stem cells are detected in vivo weeks or months after transplantation. The great majority of stem cells uh, virtually is incapable to progress towards a specific differentiation program, and the overall interaction and the overall uh, effect of the graft is that uh, we uh, are able to quantify a significantly increased in vivo availability of uh, neurotrophic factors or stem cell regulators, which altogether uh, 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 lead to a very much increased survival of endogenous neural cells. <clears throat> Now, uh, the, the, the anatomical site where we believe that the most of this interaction uh, takes place is a structure that we started observing in a very consistent way uh, uh, after having uh, transplanted systemically uh, uh, neural stem cells into mice with, uh, with the AES model of multiple sclerosis. And this new anatomical entity has been defined and observed also by independent studies as uh, a typical ectopic perivascular niche. Uh, uh, this is a, a very discrete environment uh, which is usually observed very close to blood vessels and where very low numbers of transplanted stem cells uh, uh, are able to uh, establish interaction with uh, pathogenic or uh, side infiltrating uh, inflammatory cells. In this case, they are uh, CD45 immune reactive leukocytes, uh, which can be found also in the brain of mice with stroke and which uh, can be found also in the spinal cord of mice with spinal cord injury. So at the level of the atypical ectopic perivascular stem cell niche, transplanted stem cells surviving to the transplantation procedure start interacting with uh, cells of the host immune system. And uh, you can see here a very nice example of an atypical ectopic perivascular CNS stem cell niche where uh, two uh, green transplanted neural stem cells are found 110 days post-transplantation uh, uh, in a very close contact and likely interaction with uh, spinal cord infiltrating CD45 uh, leukocytes. And you see also that two of these uh, transplanted stem cells are still able to uh, uh, express the proliferation marker Ki67, thus uh, suggesting that even three months, uh, more than three months after transplantation, a small proportion of transplanted stem cells uh, is not only alive, but is also able to undergo some cycle. Uh, however, uh, uh, one of the major questions that we were uh, asking ourselves was whether we um, 
by, sim by injecting stem cells through biological fluids, which include the bloodstream when transplantation is given intravenously, or the uh, cerebrospinal fluid when transplantation is given uh, intracerebral ventricularly, we were crea creating a sim simply a, a big experimental artifact uh, uh, whereby transplanted stem cells uh, uh, um, uh, inevitably accumulated around blood vessels, and uh, we were just observing an indirect evidence of, uh, of a false interaction. So what we did to, uh, to challenge uh, uh, our working hypothesis was to inject uh, neural stem cells focally at the level of the uh, 12th uh, thoracic segment in mice with uh, severe condition spinal cord injury, and uh, we repeated basically the very same experiment. Uh, however, we were very much surprised to observe that even following focal transplantation of the neural stem cells in these mice with spinal cord injury, where eight weeks post uh, transplantation, we were able to observe again the formation of the perivascular. You see here, uh, BV stands for blood vessel with two endothelial cells, perivascular accumulation of transplanted neural stem cells, which uh, uh, ultrastructurally and morphologically were able to retain in vivo uh, uh, their features that we had observed prior to transplantation, and in some cases, uh, these neural stem cells started as, uh, establishing very close interaction with uh, host uh, myeloid progenitor cells, which can be either macrophages or microglial cells. So uh, the working hypothesis was valid, and by going higher magnification, we started for the first time observing how intimate this interaction be between the transplanted stem cell and the host, uh, and the host uh, uh, immune-like cell might become in some cases. You see here that uh, membranes become uh, very much just opposed, and in some cases, as indicated here by these two white uh, arrowheads, uh, we can observe also uh, 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 very nice and tiny electron densities which are suggestive of formation of cellular junctions between the two cells that we uh, have detected in vivo. Then, uh, to provide uh, uh, less ambiguous uh, uh, confirmation of the cellular junctional coupling between the transplanted stem cell and the endogenous myeloid progenitor cells, we performed um, confocal data stack microscopy associated with velocity-based 3D uh, reconstruction and the convolution, uh, which is the ideal uh, uh, technique uh, to identify, as you can see here, uh, a very nice uh, uh, connexin 43 uh, uh, red uh, specific uh, cellular junctional coupling between the green uh, transplanted stem cell and the blue uh, host uh, uh, IBA1 immune reactive professional fibrocyte. <clears throat> this was the case not only when uh, transplanted stem cells were uh, injected either via biological fluids or transplanted directly into the brain, but also when uh, transplanted stem cells were given to mice with experimental immune encephalomyelitis uh, through non canonical routes. In this case, uh, stem cells were transplanted subcute in mice with EAE, the experiment uh, uh, aiming at uh, providing evidence of uh, profound immune modulation in the absence of uh, uh, or in the presence of very low numbers of uh, neural stem cells accumulating into the brain. Even when neural stem cells were injected uh, subcute, significant number of them were able to hone specifically into immunologically relevant uh, bodily sites that include secondary lymphoid organs at the level of which even 80 days post-transplantation, uh, neural stem cells that you can see here in green kept their identity, uh, uh, do, did not progress towards any differentiation program, but rather started establishing very intimate contacts with lymph node uh, resident or lymph node accumulating uh, immune-like cells. And you see here that the type of interaction with all the limitation of these 2D uh, 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 transmission electron microscopy might range from uh, uh, membrane fusion here to uh, contacts via, via uh, uh, either nanotubes or uh, uh, filipodia to uh, um, indirect evidence of production of circular membrane fragments, which in this case are uh, uh, immune reactive for GSP, which is the, the genetic tag that we used to identify neural stem cells uh, in vivo. 
And indeed, uh, uh, the functional outcome of this accumulation of uh, uh, neural stem cells into lymph nodes, uh, and I'm very sorry that the graph uh, didn't come out properly, was uh, the uh, uh, reduction not of the number, but rather of the expression of co-simulatory molecules by immature dendritic cells of the lymph nodes, which uh, in this case were not able, uh, as expected, to present the nominal antigen and, uh, and then to lead to a clinically relevant uh, EA. So overall, uh, uh, the, 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 take, the, the, final, uh, uh, the final event of this very complex, uh, almost philosophical concept of pathoclopism for uh, non-hematopoietic stem cells uh, is that uh, whatever the injection route whatever the side at which they accumulate, uh, the great majority of transplanted stem cells fail to differentiate in vivo. They contribute to increase the availability of major clothic factors and stem cell regulators uh, responsible for um, survival of endogenous tissue-specific cells, uh, and they are able to provide immune modulation within the target organ, which in our experience is the brain, uh, inducing T-cell apoptosis, uh, uh, reducing activation and or maturation of pro professional phagocytes, but they're also able to survive uh, reasonably well, even outside of the brain, and to target immunologically relevant uh, uh, bodily sites where they exert uh, equally uh, 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 some immune modulatory actions. Now, uh, all this is a reality, all this is available, all this has been showed on different uh, uh, disease, uh, uh, animal disease models, and uh, uh, of course, uh, together with uh, some evidence of cell differentiation potential in vivo, the immune modulation of, of non hematopoietic stem cells uh, uh, does represent uh, a significant strength for the uh, translation of this preclinical evidence into clinically applicable medicines. And you see here that I've listed on your left the major strengths of the uh, NSC therapies for applied to CNS disease, not only uh, the remarkable and reproducible therapeutic effects that we keep observing into clinically rele relevant animal disease models, the fact that uh, somatic NSCs are able to survive and distribute well into the brain of transplanted animals, uh, the fact that uh, uh, their uh, uh, tissue specificity leaves open a potential for uh, cell integration, replacement, and tissue restoration, the fact that uh, most of the evidence that I have uh, quickly summarized to you have uh, been uh, confirmed also in large uh, animal models of MS and uh, stroke. Uh, no major side effects have been observed so far, and phase one uh, explorative clinical trials are at the moment running in uh, several uh, laboratories and clinics uh, uh, using single donor, uh, uh, somatic, fetal, uh, long-term expanded neural stem cells, uh, uh, which are allogenic uh, in, na in nature and which have been uh, 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 transplanted into humans affected by chronic stroke, by Batten's disease, by pellet salesman's back disease, and more recently by spinal cord injury and uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. On the other hand, uh, the technology, while being such promising, also shows a number of limitations, which can be the um, actual incapacity to control the multipotency of uh, transplanted stem cells in vivo, the fact that uh, accessing to somatic neural stem cells uh, from fetal material in principle as ethical and safety issues which uh, might lead to um, uh, intra, uh, in, intra experimental variability. Somatic neural stem cells uh, have uh, clearly a very limited phenotype and genotype stability over extensive passaging in vitro and uh, they are also associated, uh, the, the, the preparation of these uh, um, advanced, ther ad advanced therapy medicinal products are associated to high costs, which are necessary to create uh, uh, cell banks, uh, such as a master, a working, and a post-production. In addition to this, the fact that uh, uh, the present uh, therapeutics are established using allogeneic single donor long-term expanded stem cell lines, uh, also uh, 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 opens the uh, discussion as whether uh, uh, chronic immune suppression on these allotrophs plants uh, 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 might be associated to uh, some uh, um, off-target effects that we are still not able to, complete, to completely predict, and uh, uh, to uh, safety issues which uh, can be uh, associated uh, to chronic immune suppression. 
So what uh, we and others uh, uh, have started doing in the lab is to uh, take significant advantage from uh, the uh, most recent uh, advances in cellular programming applied to regenerative medicine. On one side, one might think to derive patient-specific uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, which can be long-term expanded uh, in the laboratory and which can be used either to uh, model a disease in a petri dish or to be uh, uh, driven, uh, uh, be pushed towards uh, a specific uh, pre-commitment or differentiation program, uh, which can be done uh, prior to transplantation. Uh, the other option, which is uh, significantly more rapid and more efficient, uh, is to apply direct conversion technologies to somatic cells. This is what uh, uh, my lab has been uh, doing uh, for the last uh, uh, couple of years in collaboration with Frank and also at the University of Würzburg, with whom we have established uh, at the moment uh, uh, strain-specific rodent uh, INSCs out of uh, skin-derived fibroblasts. To, uh, with the idea of uh, developing uh, uh, an autologous source of uh, immunomodulatory or also tissue trophic uh, 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 somatic-like stem cells. And the data that we uh, uh, have collected in, uh, uh, in the mouse system are very encouraging. So with Frank and offer using combination of transient and persistent, persistent expression of, uh, of reprogramming transcription factors, uh, we have generated uh, C57 black 6 mouse induced neural stem cells. We have started their, their proliferation properties in vitro, comparing them with a gold standard somatic uh, SVZ derived uh, neural stem progenital cells. And you see that, uh, that uh, the uh, proliferation features of um, NSCs are superimposable to those of somatic uh, neural stem cells. We also uh, have started the expression of uh, uh, cell addition molecules and pro-inflammatory chemoreceptors, which might be predicted of uh, the pathotropism of these cells when in, in transplanted in vivo into mice with relevant disease models. You see that, for example, CD44 is significantly more expressed on two NSCs as compared to to somatic neural stem cells, while alpha-4 integrin is lower and CCR2 is again higher. We also checked for their multipotency after uh, growth factor withdrawal and uh, collected uh, uh, convincing data of maintenance of uh, multipotency in vitro as expressed uh, 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 as capacity to give rise to uh, uh, neurons, oligodendrocytes and astrocytes, uh, which again is pretty much super impossible to what uh, initially observed on NPCs. Then, with the idea of investigating uh, some of their immune modulatory actions, uh, we have established uh, a, a very informative uh, transplant co-culture system where NSCs or NPCs are co-cultured with uh, bone marrow derived macrophages, showing interestingly that uh, NSCs are uh, very much capable to reduce in a dose-dependent way the uh, uh, upregulation of uh, uh, the two pro-inflammatory genes, IL-6 and IL-1-beta, after activation of macrophages with uh, the toll-like receptor for ligand LPS. So very nice preliminary evidence of some immune modulatory actions by INSCs. Then, uh, uh, in a very translational effort, uh, we have uh, we are missing a slide. Okay, we have uh, we have uh, uh, transplanted uh, GSP uh, transduced uh, neural stem cells or NSCs into the lateral into the left lateral ventricle of mice with uh, clinically evident uh, uh, experimental MOG, MOG induced experimental immune encephalomyelitis as a model of uh, of uh, uh, multiple sclerosis and collected both uh, uh, behavioral. Uh, by means of EAE score, as well as unbiased uh, uh, gate uh, analysis uh, showing significant uh, reduction of accumulation of secondary damage in mice with EAE transplanted ICV either with somatic NPCs, but again, this is not novel and published several years ago, but also uh, uh, transplanted with uh, uh, directly induced uh, mouse-specific uh, INSCs. All these data are very promising and we very much look forward to, to progressing to uh, additional studies which will involve soon also human analysis. Um, 
Detection in vivo transplanted cells is, a, is again very interesting because also with uh, uh, NSCs we, find, we found uh, uh, convincing evidence that transplanted stem cells are found very close to lateral ventricles. They also found uh, 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 30 days post-transplantation uh, at the level of the cardiac plexus, very close to uh, uh, IBAR1 in new reactive uh, professional phagocytes. Uh, and again here, professional phagocytes close to GFP immune reactive transplanted cells. So there is again, even with directly convert uh, NSCs, good survival, uh, homing into immunologically relevant uh, CNS uh, sites, including the cardioid plexus. And in this case, you see a very nice uh, 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 reconstruction of a CD31 immune reactive blood vessel with uh, some CD45 immune reactive leukocytes, which are extra vasating for the blood vessel, and two uh, uh, GFP immune reactive neural stem cells, again found in very close vicinity with uh, uh, one CD45 immune reactive leukocyte. So, uh, uh, having, having discussed very generally of uh, the most translational aspects of uh, um, uh, neural stem cell research applied to brain diseases, uh, I think that uh, it, it, it might sound not completely provocative to uh, anticipate that in vivo, after transplantation, uh, not being able to control properly or uh, accurately the way stem cells should or might differentiate into a specific lineage, uh, uh, we might think that uh, the, the interplay between the different neuroinflammatory signals coming from the environment, the level at which uh, stem cells are either transplanted or uh, uh, accumulate in two, might really influence the function of the stem cell graft uh, in the injured CNS. And I provided here a few examples of uh, neuroprotection, uh, clothic support, uh, immune modulation, tissue homeostasis, as well as uh, differentiation into neurons uh, and uh, glial progenitor cells. And it is quite, uh, it is quite uh, uh, reassuring and, and interesting that uh, the field is moving, is progressing. Uh, uh, the, cha the, the mind of, of uh, uh, the groups that uh, have been working uh, extensively on two stem cell issues in the last couple of decades is changing. And this, uh, new, this perspective paper, which was published uh, a couple of years ago on, on, uh, on science translational medicine, clearly anticipates uh, the way we should start looking at, uh, at, uh, at stem cell therapeutics. Um, in this case, the uh, example, the proof of concept example was to compare side by side four major aspects of um, efficacy uh, or mechanism of action of, of cell-based therapeutics uh, with uh, the very same aspects uh, that uh, had been extensively studied for small molecules and biologics. And you see here that selectivity of action might be simply based on molecular recognition for small molecules, and it becomes much more complex for stem cells, and uh, practic practically dependent from complex sensing and response systems. The distribution uh, uh, is uh, all about diffusion and transport uh, for small molecules, uh, and it might become very much directed cell migration, and I gave to you the idea that pathotropic uh, associated uh, behavior might be responsible of a specific uh, uh, targeting uh, by stem cells in vivo. The dose uh, uh, might be very precisely calculated for, for small molecules. It becomes uh, uh, by far more uh, empirical for uh, cells uh, and stem cells, uh, depending on uh, their survival and their proliferation uh, following transplantation. And the therapeutic niche of action uh, um, might be controlled uh, re uh, remarkably well for small molecules. Uh, it is uh, uh, much more difficult to uh, predict which specific therapeutic niche stem cells uh, might have because uh, the way they target a specific niche uh, is the, the, the final consequence of uh, a number of, uh, uh, of actions which um, require control, distribution, and duration of action. So for, for this and, and a number of other reasons, uh, we got uh, very excited a few years ago uh, about stem cell signaling and about the study of uh, the mechanism by which uh, uh, stem cells and, and uh, stem cell grafts might communicate with the host. And we, we decided for, uh, for, for uh, um, a number of reasons to, uh, to, to, to focus on the way uh, stem cells might signal uh, with the immune system. 
Uh, in this slide, you can see that uh, what we, we uh, everyone knows uh, uh, after having studied biology at school, we know that cells and systems communicate by contact-dependent interactions. We know they can communicate by release of paraprime factors, which uh, uh, work uh, uh, in different ways. Uh, they also uh, uh, can trigger endocrine-like uh, responses uh, in the host after transplantation, and they also can work uh, via the release of uh, very complex circular membrane fragments uh, uh, that are called extracellular membrane vesicles, uh, which really would work as a very sophisticated conveyors uh, of a number of uh, different responses to target cells. And the laughter is the, the, the aspect that we decided to, to focus on a, a few years back, possibly because it was much less uh, investigated and uh, because uh, the risk of, uh, uh, of uh, finding uh, uh, um, unpredicted, uh, uh, unpredicted behavior was, uh, was uh, uh, significantly high. So we were very excited of uh, challenging this completely new field. The, the very first experiment that we did to, uh, to understand whether uh, uh, there was a rationale uh, behind the study of extracellular membrane-based uh, um, uh, biology was to, uh, um, to make a very straightforward comparison of some anti-proliferative or immunodulatory effects of all parental NPCs with those uh, that we could observe uh, uh, after having collected uh, um, extracellular membrane vesicles from tissue culture media. In the bar graph on your left, you see an EDU-based quantification of proliferating cells in uh, an in vitro uh, CD3, CD28 uh, activation of uh, spleen-derived T cells, which uh, are either untreated or which uh, are, um, are co-cultured with uh, um, NPCs or with uh, NPC-derived uh, vesicles. And, uh, uh, very clearly, you see that the anti-proliferative effect of NPCs that we have showed several years ago is uh, completely, completely reproduced uh, by their uh, vesicular counterpart. And looking at uh, uh, um, uh, survival or death of uh, uh, um, splenocytes uh, after co-culture with uh, after treatment with vesicles or NPCs you see that in addition to this anti-proliferative effect, there is also a very good uh, and remarkable pro-survival effect, which is quite interesting. Uh, and while the, uh, the inhibition of proliferation is completely super impossible uh, when comparing uh, NPCs with EVs, uh, we found a significant difference uh, in the um, uh, production of the pro-inflammatory cytokines by, by T cells uh, co-culture with uh, either uh, NPCs or vesicles with uh, NPCs only being able to significantly reduce the production of the pro-inflammatory cytokine interferon gamma, which was not uh, achieved by uh, EV treatment. So uh, there is uh, a significant uh, sharing of uh, uh, inhibitory effect by the two uh, components, but there is also some exclusive action which uh, parental cells only are able to, uh, to drive. <clears throat> then the, 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 the most logical experiment was to see how much uh, material we could collect out of tissue culture media. Um, this was a move initially, but this snapshot can be equally informative. Uh, it was a 10, live, live, uh, 10 minutes live imaging of a, a single neural stem cell coming from an, uh, an F, Farnesilated GFP transduced uh, NPC line, showing uh, uh, very, very generally, uh, 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 upon uh, membrane tagging with this fatness-related GFP, how much membrane recycling neural stem cell cultured in under homeostatic conditions might show uh, in vitro. The, the final outcome of, uh, of uh, collecting vesicles out of uh, neural stem cell media being uh, the dynamic light scattering analysis that you can observe uh, on, your, uh, on your top left which uh, shows uh, uh, our capability to um, detect and quantify at least uh, three size classes of, uh, of total vesicles. The first of which uh, 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 shows an, an average size which is highly predictive for uh, exosome or exosome-like particles. The second of which, which is uh, 10 times larger 
and therefore um, is suggestive of uh, shed-like vesicles, and the third of which, which is instead uh, suggestive of uh, vesicle aggregates. Uh, then I have to move to the second set of slides. So after these uh, this experiments, uh, uh, and with a good and abundant material in hand, uh, we thought uh, to provide uh, 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 biochemical characterization of the vesicle pellet that we were able to collect out of tissue media, tissue culture media, showing uh, basically that uh, similarly to other cell sources, uh, total vesicles uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, sucrose created fractionated exosomes uh, from neural stem cells uh, look like, biochemically speaking, uh, um, uh, exosomes and vesicles from any other cell type. They show expression of uh, accepted markers uh, for exosomes in red, like uh, Alex, uh, TSG101, CD63, and CD9. They also show expression of markers which are described to be associated uh, only to exosomes like each of protein 70 and uh, ago one And they also show expression of markers to be uh, described to be enriched into exosomes uh, like TNF receptor 1 and each of protein 90. Then applying combination of uh, sucrose beta fractionation and nanoparticle tracking analysis, we were able to show that uh, after sucrose beta fractionation, we uh, observed a significant enrichment uh, into exosome-like particles uh, whose um, average size was around 100 nanometers. Uh, thus meaning that only that the sucrose beta fractionation was uh, done properly. Then another experiment that we did uh, was the following. We wonder whether, in addition to uh, still uh, very little characterized cellular machinery, which is able to, uh, which is responsible for the secretion of extracellular membrane vesicles, uh, neural stem cells, uh, which we had studied for immune modulatory properties for the previous 15 years, uh, would also have uh, uh, a machinery which is able to sense the environment and to modify both uh, uh, in quantity and in quality the uh, 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 amount of, uh, of vesicles that are continuously released uh, onto the extracellular space. And to, to, uh, to interrogate uh, uh, the environment, to inter interrogate the, the, the machinery of the cell responsible for uh, exome production, we um, created in the lab two uh, uh, cytokine cocktails which uh, were uh, highly reminiscent uh, of a classical pro-inflammatory environment when the mix was made of interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and IL-1 beta, or alternatively reminiscent of a classical TH2-like anti-inflammatory environment when the cytokine cocktail was made with uh, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. And the very first crude experiment that we did was to expose uh, neural stem cells producing exosomes to either of these uh, cytokine cocktails and then quantify by, dynamic, by nanoparticle tracking analysis the quantity of the vesicles that had been produced in response to either environment. And we found, interestingly, that uh, while the total amount of, uh, of uh, vesicles is not much different when comparing uh, uh, basal TH1 and TH2-like conditions, we found a significant increase in uh, uh, small-size uh, bona fide exosomes uh, out collected out of those um, uh, uh, neural stem cells which had been exposed for a total of 16 hours uh, to a TH1-like uh, cytokine cocktail, which is very interesting because it uh, anticipates the presence of uh, sensors of inflammation onto neural stem cells, which uh, activate a specific intracellular signaling pathway, which might be responsible some way of the production of extracellular membrane vesicles. Then what uh, we did was to uh, subject uh, uh, neural stem cells uh, to, uh, uh, to um, uh, next generation long RNA sequencing and to uh, uh, see how neural stem cells uh, were responding to either, uh, uh, the, either uh, the cytokine cocktail that we had been using to um, uh, uh, produce this perturbation to the system. And not surprisingly, we found that when uh, uh, neural stem cells are exposed to TH1-like cytokines, they activate a specific uh, start one signaling response, uh, uh, which is highly specific for uh, one of the three uh, cytokines, interferon gamma, able to bind to interferon gamma receptor 1 and 2 and to activate start one signaling response into the cell. And you see here a very significant, in green, 
uh, and specific response to, to, to interferon gamma. On the other hand, uh, um, TH2 cytokine cocktail, regardless of the fact that TH2-like uh, cytokine receptors are indeed expressed on neural stem cells, uh, fail to evoke any specific uh, response on the cell. And by looking at GO uh, enrichment, uh, you can observe here uh, that uh, uh, neural stem cells exposed to TH1-like pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, mount a number of uh, responses which altogether uh, make uh, these cells very much immune-like. This is very interesting. We uh, uh, extended our uh, long RNA sequencing uh, approach also to, uh, not only to neural stem cells, but also to uh, total uh, membrane vesicles and sucrose gradient fractionated exosomes. And uh, uh, it was very, very exciting to observe that uh, the type of regulation that we uh, found to be significantly up in uh, TH1 NPCs as compared to TH1 uh, to basal NPCs, which uh, uh, is here highlighted in red, it is all about interferon gamma pathway, was also found to be equally regulated into TH1 vesicles compared to basal vesicles, and also onto TH1 exosomes as compared to uh, basal exosomes, which suggests that uh, 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 pro-inflammatory cytokines make uh, neural stem cells immune-like, and the type of immune-like reaction that uh, is observed into the cells is uh, clustered or loaded to both extracellular vesicles uh, and to exosomes for specific, uh, de de therefore opening a big question as whether this response that is exported uh, towards extracellular vesicles might be available and eventually relevant for intercellular pro communication problems. Uh, and you can see here from this analysis of a number of uh, more, more, more detailed uh, longer NASIC data that uh, TH1, uh, uh, that the EV transcriptome is reactive to, to cytokines and that uh, uh, TH1 EVs contain also the messenger RNA for the major transcription factor being upregulated following interferon gamma signaling pattern, which is start, start one. Um, now, uh, at, at, at this stage, the question was whether uh, what we uh, were observing uh, was uh, uh, going to be functional and whether uh, loading or trafficking of long RNAs might be associated, as uh, had been previously described, to uh, loading or trafficking also of proteins. So what we did was to combine long RNA seq with uh, uh, biochemistry, and surprisingly, but uh, uh, very interestingly, we found uh, that uh, uh, NPCs TH1 uh, uh, and the uh, same way uh, um, ex uh, extracellular vesicles TH1 and exosomes TH1 showed uh, a significant uh, and very specific upregulation of uh, total and phosphorylated STAT1, uh, uh, which was not observed uh, uh, at any level in either basal or TH2 treated. Uh, uh, cells, vesicles, and exosomes, with a prelimi preliminary conclusion following this experiment that NPCs would trust the components of the interferon gamma signaling pathway via extracellular vesicles. Now, uh, um, with all this in hands, and with the final big question that uh, was uh, how much of this uh, might have uh, relevance or function when extracellular vesicles are uh, exp uh, where when extracellular vesicles are given to a target cell. So, uh, in order to develop uh, a completely unbiased approach and uh, not uh, uh, having decided not to follow uh, a single a single mechanism or potential mechanism of, in of communication, we, uh, uh, as I say, we develop a completely unbiased approach where. Basal TH1 or TH2 media were collected from uh, NPCs as before, where uh, 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 we were able to uh, uh, produce uh, basal TH1 and TH2 vesicle pellets, and where we treated with either of these uh, uh, treatments uh, NIH3 uh, T3 cells as gold standard target cells for um, either uh, all genome or uh, all protein analysis, which we had in mind to combine in order to uh, identify the different levels of interaction between uh, stem cells and target cells uh, mediated by stem cell-derived uh, extracellular vesicles. Uh, uh, 
and you see from this, uh, from this very nice super resolution imaging movie uh, how efficient uh, might be the incorporation of, uh, of uh, RFP uh, tagged CD63 immune reactive uh, vesicles uh, onto FGFP uh, target cells. And here, uh, even much better, uh, uh, 24 hours after uh, uh, treatment, uh, you see also evidence of a double, a double membrane, where uh, in green we see the membrane of the FGFP target cell, and in red uh, the uh, genetic tag that we have introduced in neural stem cells to identify their secreted vesicles. So what we uh, observed from uh, from uh, from this uh, uh, all protein and all uh, um, all genome studies that we applied to tiger cells treated with uh, with this different vesicle preparations was that indeed there were a number effects of the gene and protein regulation which were uh, completely shared between. Uh, between base cell Th1 and Th2 vesicle preparation. However, we also found uh, interesting evidence of a specific uh, regulation of uh, gene and protein expression by Th1 vesicle preparation only, which uh, are uh, uh, the very same one uh, uh, within which we have we had found uh, significantly enriched all the interferon gamma signaling pathway at uh, RNA and protein level. And applying also in this case uh, a, a, a very sophisticated GO enrichment analysis, we found uh, uh, to, uh, that the very same GOs that we had found upregulated in NPCs TH1 before uh, uh, are still very much uh, uh, represented into uh, target cells treated with uh, uh, um, TH1 vesicle preparation. Again, you see the target cells uh, upregulate uh, uh, terms coding for antigen processing and presentation, response to interferon beta, and uh, innate immune responses. With uh, STAT1 being the most upregulated gene in target cells treated with Th1 uh, extracellular vesicles, but not being the only one. Looking in more details, we found uh, STAT1 indeed to be specifically specifically upregulated after treatment with Th1 vesicles, but along with the SAT1 we also found uh, IGTP, PSMB9, and beta-2 microglobulin as additional members of the interferon gamma signaling response. And it was also very interesting to observe that uh, target cells treated uh, with either vesicles Th1 or exosomes Th1 again showed the significant uh, upregulation of uh, total and phosphostat as well as beta-2 microglobulin as compared to the other controls which were target cells either not treated with vesicles or treated with either basal or Th2 vesicle preparation. So at this stage the preliminary, uh, the second preliminary conclusion being that NPCs might induce functional components of the interferon gamma signaling pathway into target cells via vesicles. And we had no evidence whatsoever at this stage as whether all this was due to direct cluster of uh, either proteins or messenger RNA or uh, modulation or induction of a specific response via a still not identified mechanism on two targets. So, uh, with uh, uh, very complex extracellular membrane vesicles in ends, which we know uh, are capable to deliver uh, uh, membrane-bound ligands, membrane-bound proteins, messenger RNA, even non, non, small non-coding RNA receptors, uh, we uh, had to investigate whether this type of signaling that stem cells were able to induce and to target cells via their vesicles uh, was due to direct signaling or to deliver. And having a few candidates uh, uh, to investigate coming up from the RNA-seq data and from the biochemistry, we started uh, establishing uh, uh, a mutant neural stem cell lines which uh, were um, knocked down for uh, the transcription factor STAT1. And surprising, and, and we did actually the very same experiment, so we uh, collected the vesicles out of tissue culture media either under basal TH1 conditions or even after preconditioning with interferon gamma only. And then we did the very same cluster experiment, studying the type of signaling response that either of these vesicle preparations, as compared to controls, was able to induce on two targets. 
And surprisingly, we found that uh, while uh, 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 lacking STAT1, uh, these, all these vesicle preparations, uh, uh, either TH1, uh, STAT1 knockout, or interferon gamma only STAT1 knockout, uh, were able to induce a remarkable modulation of interferon gamma signaling pathway on two target cells, thus suggesting that uh, the presence of the transcription factor STAT1 in two vesicles is just dispensable for the modulation of the interferon gamma signaling pathway on two target cells. Then, as a second experiment, we, de we developed, we established uh, a, a mutant uh, neural stem cell lines and as a consequence, vesicle preparations which were knocked down for uh, the, either the receptors uh, uh, responsive to interferon gamma, either interferon gamma receptor 1 knockout uh, vesicle preparations or interferon gamma receptor 2 knockout vesicle preparations. And uh, finally, we started observing something very interesting because we observed that uh, the presence of interferon gamma receptor 2, similarly to STAT1, is just dispensable for uh, these vesicles to signal to target cells, while interferon gamma receptor 1 is just indispensable. You see here that interferon gamma receptor 1 knockout uh, vesicle preparations uh, 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 are not able to induce uh, uh, any, uh, any uh, um, uh, start one signaling response into target cells, uh, regardless of the fact that they have been uh, uh, collected after uh, preconditioning uh, of their parental stem cell lines with TH1 uh, cytokine cocktails or with interferon gamma only. So uh, uh, the, at this stage, uh, the question was uh, whether the presence of interferon gamma receptor 1 on two vesicles uh, uh, is uh, doing what? Uh, uh, so we, uh, we introduce an additional level of complexity when comparing uh, vesicles that had been collected uh, from NPCs treated uh, with uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines uh, or basal um, vesicles that we pre-treated only for a few minutes uh, with non-concentration of interferon gamma, which uh, uh, in that case were derived from basal neural stem cells. And interestingly enough, you see here that uh, that uh, uh, both uh, basal interferon gamma, but also interferon gamma conditioned uh, wild type EVs are able to signal uh, uh, to target cells, while on the other end, uh, in neither of these conditions is able to induce any detectable signaling response into target cells. And all this is also associated to a significant increase of the levels uh, of the secreted uh, uh, pro-inflammatory chemokine MCP2 CSL8. So at this stage, uh, the uh, model that we uh, would propose being that uh, uh, in this specific uh, very reductionistic uh, uh, system that aims at investigating how uh, uh, pro-inflammatory uh, or uh, pro-inflammatory NPCs or NPCs exposed to pro-inflammatory environment might signal to immune cells, we uh, have provided significant evidence of the indispensability of uh, the uh, receptor 1 for interferon gamma on the surface of, uh, of, uh, uh, of extracellular vesicles, while uh, uh, the transcription uh, factor STAT1 and uh, all the messengers that are significantly trafficked towards the vesicles after exposure to pro inflammatory chemicals uh, are just dispensable. Uh, and the, model, the final model of action being of uh, vesicles which are secreted uh, from stem cells uh, which are able to uh, uh, to specifically bind uh, to available ligand and cytokines uh, 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 in the extracellular compartment via uh, high affinity receptor interaction. Uh, ideally, there is one high affinity receptor one for interferon gamma on the vesicle and another high affinity receptor one for the interferon gamma on the target cell. Uh, and uh, uh, vesicles uh, in this way are able to bind, to recycle and retarget uh, the excess of extracellular cytokines uh, two target cells which, however, had to possess the machinery to be responsive to the extracellular ligand. So going uh, quickly to uh, my conclusion uh, uh, and adding a clear and uh, translational effort and mission in the lab, uh, our mission and our challenge for uh, uh, stem cell therapeutics uh, is becoming more and more interested to study uh, this novel aspect of stem cell communication or stem cell signaling. We believe that priority has to be given to the identification of the mechanism behind uh, 
what is very generally called by Sander effect or therapeutic plasticity of stem cells. So we have to start tackling individual individual aspects of uh, of signaling. We need to clarify the specificity of any of the intercellular communication programs, if there is any. We have the obligation to attribute a role to inflammation in uh, some of these therapeutic plasticity. Inflammation is always around, and uh, uh, with our study, we have provided uh, significant uh, evidence that stem cells uh, indeed sense inflammation. My, we target some spe specific uh, inflammatory ligands. And in perspective, uh, the old field might become more and more excited uh, with the idea that uh, uh, it would be possible to make the old druggable using uh, not only classical stem cell therapeutics, but also stem cell completely free technologies uh, uh, such as acellular therapies. Um, the work that I have shown with you today has been um, a very long-standing uh, 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 mission and enterprise which uh, have involved a number of uh, uh, Kila members uh, 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 that include Chiara Cossetti and uh, Nunzio Raci, who, who, who both have been uh, very important driving forces of, uh, of the, of the extracellular vesicle signaling story. On the other hand, uh, I have to acknowledge the contribution of Luca Peruzzotti, uh, Iametti, Giulia Mallucci, uh, 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 and uh, and uh, Gillian Tannahill uh, for the uh, INSC uh, work, which is uh, 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 becoming more and more promising. And I have to conclude uh, upon acknowledging the remarkable contribution of uh, key collaborators uh, over uh, Europe and uh, and the States, uh, Frank Edenhofer in uh, Germany, uh, uh, Antonia Wright, EDBI, EMBL in Inkston, Christian Frezza uh, in Cambridge, the MRC Cancer Cell Unit, uh, and John Matic, the Gavran Institute uh, at Sydney in Australia, and Jose Manuel Garcia Verdugo at the University of Valencia. And I, I can conclude my, my webinar with this final, uh, oh, okay, the movie can be played properly, with this final uh, slide, which uh, show, uh, uh, show you the way we have in mind to start, uh, start uh, believing stem cell therapeutics work. It, it is all a matter of, uh, of stem cells capable to sense a specific environment, and once they are there, they start establishing a very kind of homeostatic-like competition programs with endogenous cells. And uh, the smarter wins, and the smarter is able to, uh, to drive uh, reconstitution of the environment in homeostatic-like conditions, which in the brain are very often associated to either brain repair or restoration of brain function. And uh, I can conclude here, and I thank you all very much for your attention, and I'll be very happy to take up your questions. Thank you for that highly informative presentation, Dr. Pulcino. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. There were many good questions already submitted, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Additional unanswered questions will be answered in text form by Dr. Pulcino and posted with the webinar replay link. Our first question is, how do you think the composition of extracellular vesicles changes in the onset of a pathological, pathological condition? Can dysregulated release of extracellular vesicles contribute to a pathological condition? Okay, this is a this is a very important question, but I don't think I have a final answer. We we have had, we have indirect evidence from pathological conditions, where, for example, the, the very first that comes into my mind is glioblastoma, a very very severe brain tumor, where um, glioblastoma derived vesicles can be detected uh, into biological fluids, which include CSF, and uh, and the bloodstream. Uh, however, uh, when uh, dealing with uh, uh, conditions where um, the risk of, uh, of, of collecting prom promiscuous samples of vesicles, which uh, in practice come from different sources, including the main source of the pathology that we would like to study, the risk of, uh, 
of, uh, of uh, having uh, uh, false data is too high. So the, the challenge of the field is to develop new technologies for um, uh, the sorting or for the fractionation uh, uh, of uh, vesicles uh, from autobiological fluids, uh, uh, including microfluidics and including uh, antigen-based patterning, which should uh, allow us understanding much better how the pathological condition reacts to its progression uh, and uh, uh, secretes uh, extracellular vesicles. Great, thank you for that. Uh, our next question comes from Samuel Marsh, the University of Cal California, Irvine, and he asked, what is the percentage of survival of mouse-derived neural stem cells transplanted back into mice? Child, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I didn't hear the question, Chad. Can you repeat it again? I'm passing you full control again. My apologies. Uh, the question was, what is the percentage of survival of mouse-derived neural stem cells transplanted back into mice? I'm I'm very sorry, but I didn't hear the question. Can you can you re repeat it again? I, I'm giving you full control again. One second. I do apologize. I uh, have submitted the question in the private chat window. Uh, uh, Dr. Pluchino, but the question again is, what is the percentage of survival of mouse-derived neural stem cells transplanted back into mice? Oh, okay. Um, what is the percentage? Um, it is it is quite uh, quite um, established now that uh, whatever uh, whatever um, animal model uh, you challenge via stem cell therapeutics um, with stem cells which are not derived from which are non-hematopoietic stem cells and which eventually include uh, mesenchymal stem cells or neural stem cells, the survival rate of the graft is always between one and five percent. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, and I've also posted this in the private chat in case you can't hear me, um, but is what was the source of the extracellular vesicles? Uh, and more specifically, typically how many cells do you need to culture to isolate extracellular vesicles to do further experiments with? This is another good question, and there is a lot of discussion as whether uh, it is uh, uh, financially more convenient uh, to do stem cell work rather than extracellular vesicle-based work. Um, you have to imagine that uh, to do the type of experiment we, that we are used to do with stem cells, we have to, we have to work with uh, between 10 and 15 times more stem cells. So to, to have enough material, enough vesicles, to do uh, in vivo injection or um, uh, sequencing experiments or even uh, uh, um, live imaging experiments, we have to handle between 10 and 15 times more neural stem cells than those needed for classical, uh, classical stem cell experiments. Thanks again. Our next question is, did you try uh, different types of injection methods, uh, intravascular, intradermis, or subepithelial? Yes, indeed. We tried different injection routes and different uh, stem cell numbers. 
we tried uh, intravenous injection in mice with uh, experimental immunoencephalomyelitis, which were also injected uh, uh, ICV, intracerebroventricularly. We injected cells uh, intra, um, intravenously also in mice with cerebral stroke, and we also injected uh, stem cells uh, uh, focally at the level of the contusion site uh, into the spinal cord in mice with contusion spinal cord injury. I'm, I'm, I see there is also another question at the moment. So instead of uh, uh, um, uh, giving the uh, 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 passing the, the, the voice to Chad, I will reply to this additional question, which is how long uh, the stem cells stay in the organs? Uh, um, um, it depends. It, 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 it depends very much on the on the on the animal disease model. Uh, we have um, we have showed that uh, persistence of uh, systemically injected neural stem cells into into uh, uh, let's say filter organs, uh, including the kidney, the gut, uh, the bladder, uh, and the intestine, uh, uh, stays as long as 15 days post transplantation in mice with mog induced chronic experimental immune encephalomyelitis. Persistence might become longer in uh, mice with relapsing remitting EAE, which is more inflammatory disease model. Uh, we have observed very, very low numbers of uh, peripherally accumulating and persisting cells in non-human primates with EAE, uh, um, but never observed any, any side effect, uh, including clot formation or teratoma formation associated with, uh, with uh, with uh, detector cells. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, we'll answer one last question, and it's uh, whether or not you use flow cytometry uh, to control the purity or the absence of differentiation of the cell suspension. We do, we do use a lot of flow cytometry, especially for phenotyping. We, we have done in the past some uh, cell sorting um, when uh, lentiviral vectors were not uh, uh, yet uh, fully established technology in the lab, but we don't use flow cytometry to control the absence of differentiation in the cell suspension. Um, we usually... Um, we, are, we have a good confidence with, uh, with the stem cell technology that we are handling. Uh, differentiation is, uh, is uh, only partial the, uh, in, the, in the stem cell preparation that we transplant uh, in a way that between 5 and 6 percent of the cells that we, we uh, grow up uh, in, in culture are uh, bona fide stem cells, which means they are un completely undifferentiated. There is, uh, however, a 95 percent of progenitor cells which uh, uh, show already some uh, features of partial commitment towards a specific lineage fate, but this presence is not detrimental for the uh, the final effect uh, of the of the graft. Great, thanks again. Uh, a very informative and um, a very uh, well spoken talk. Uh, but unfortunately, we are out of time. I want, to I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Beckman Coulter, and of course, Dr. Stefano Puccino for making today's edu educational webinar uh, possible. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.